ladies and gentlemen, how are we? Yeah. Yeah. This is good from down there. Thank you so well done. Good. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much for coming. Hope you're feeling well. Uh, this is my show, by the way. I'm not just some nutter who's just come on and start <laughs> turn the fucking music. I am a nutter, but we, I'm going to be here. I've written something, okay? So that's that's the difference, right? Thank you very much for coming to my show. Uh, my show is called Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus. Um, I like I like to pick a sort of neutral title when I'm doing the free shows. You don't, you don't want anything too divisive, do you know what I mean? You don't want to divide the audience too much. So the show's called Eat Your Queer Feet for Jesus. It's not just one of those clever PR hook lines to get people, it's genuinely horrific, right? So from this moment on, anything, it's all downhill from this point in, right? So, And I'm doing very well. If you haven't heard of me, which I'm assuming most of you haven't, I'm doing very well, as you can tell. I'm the guy who called the show for five minutes' time and to get you all up here. I'm the guy at the door as you walked in, and I'm doing the only introduction <laughs> to a show I've had to fucking write right? that I'm not even getting paid for, right? So I'm doing fucking well, actually, okay? So um, uh, thank you for coming. And, and I do realise this is a free show. And when you come to a free show, I've done the free shows before, and audiences who come to free shows, you have a certain mentality. You come in here, you're all sat there now, you're all thinking the same thing. You're thinking... This is a free show, it's probably going to be shit. <laughs> That's okay, right? Don't worry. Thank you, I'm getting heckled by people in the street now, right? Okay. <laughs> That's okay, you can, you can think that. But I want to know, you should be proud of yourself for all being here tonight, right? Because you haven't taken the easy way out, right? Because what you could have done, you're at the Brighton Fringe, you've got loads of comedians coming in. What you could have done tonight, you could have gone to a venue that had fancy things like air conditioning, right? And <laughs> carpets and shit like that, right? You could have done that. You could have gone and seen a comedian who you've heard of, right, okay, who's on the telly, right, you could have done that, right, but instead you came in now, if you'd done that, you'd have paid a tenner, and you probably would have, like, and you, for your ten pounds, you know what you'd have got for your ten pounds? You'd have got an hour of jokes, and they would have all been funny. <laughs> Where's the fucking excitement in that? There's no, is it? <laughs> None whatsoever. You guys are the so you come again. It's so this could be so bad. Why did we come here? <laughs> we can't even walk out. It's just going to cause a scene. Oh fuck! Right. So, but the first thing I need to do is I need to bring myself uh, on stage. I'll bring myself off later. Don't worry. You don't have to do that. But I need you guys. <laughs> I think I need you guys to bring me on. And this is my last night. This is my twelfth show in a row. And this is my last night. So I need you. To, thank you for cheering that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, no more. <laughs> This is my last show, so please make sure you give a big, as big a whoop and a holler and wave your penises in the air. If you haven't got one, get someone else's, right? Okay, just improvise, I trust you, okay? Right now, so welcome on stage with his show, Eat a Queer Feats for Jesus, Mr. Richard Coughlin! <laughs> Good evening, thank you very much for coming. So, let's just do a quick check of the room. And now you decide to have a conversation when the show started. That's great. No. Thank you for coming tonight, David. It's brilliant to have you. Uh, Brighton Fringe. Have we been enjoying the Brighton Fringe? Yeah. You have been enjoying. I love coming to the Fringe shows. I really love coming to the Fringe shows because you get the full spectrum of the entertainment world, right? You get you get to see some of the most brilliant and talented and, and wonderful live entertainment you've ever seen in your life, and then you get to see some of the most unmitigated shit you've ever seen in your life. You, <laughs> I can't believe these fuckers have got the cognitive faculties to put their socks on in a fucking morning, let alone organise. Has anyone seen any shit since they've been here? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's always something. You've got to see some shit, right? You've got to see some shit. I used to think the shittest of the shit was mime artists. Right? Are there any here? They never answer. Right? Fuck them. Right? I used to think it was mime artists. That was until I saw my first human statue. Hate these people. Right? It's not a fucking job. These are people who looked at my artists and thought, "That's too much fucking hard work." That right? I'll just, I'll just take the movement element out of this. Right? It's not. A Every time I see one, I like. I hope you get Parkinson's. I really fucking do, mate. Right? <laughs> Find out the cruelty of fucking show business then, won't you? Right? Uh, actually, actually, um, live in Brighton now, and um, I, live, I, I live, live around Brighton anyway. Anyone from Brighton? Can you cheer if you're from Brighton? Yeah, a few of you that it's good. I actually, um, I've moved around a lot in the last few years. Um, originally, I was living at home. In fact, that was in this economy at the moment. The way it is, my plan to get on the property ladder was I was waiting for my parents to die. That was there's a fuck going yeah over there. So I think, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Have you got onto the poisoning stage yet? Mate, that's, the, that's the stage I got to when they asked me to leave. I had to, had to leave and go to Dun. I lived in Dunfermline in Scotland for about a year where Fifty Shades of Grey is the fucking weather forecast every fucking day. And then, but then I ended up living in London. Anyone from London? Yeah. There's a few of you here, that's why you're at a free show. You can't afford fuck all else, can you? You could, 
Because I, I was living in London, I lived in two places in London. I ended up living in a greenhouse in an abandoned allotment in Clapham, right? Uh, it's still 800 quid a week. I don't know how they fucking manage it, right? right. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever lived in a greenhouse before. Anyone? No, never. Never a massive fucking reaction to that one, but I was living in this greenhouse in Clapham and I didn't know how I was supposed to fuck, how I was going to deal with it. And no one gave me any good advice. I don't know if it might happen to you, so here's a bit of advice here. The only bit of advice people gave me was they said, that old cliche saying where they go, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Yeah, I learned it's not a good idea to wank during the day either. <laughs> they weren't my fucking tomatoes, I don't know why I was supposed to care, but the um... But then after I, moved, after I moved out of there, I ended up living in uh, North London for a bit. And I ended up living, there was this guy, he was looking for a flatmate, so I just went there. Never knew him, didn't know anything about him. All I knew about him, his name was Ishmael, and he came from Israel. Now that rhymes and it's funny, but it's not a basis for a friendship, is it, right? So I thought, I'll do a little joke to sort of break the ice, sort of get in there, we can get to know each other, become friends. So I thought it'd be funny, because he's from Israel, I thought it would be funny if every morning I gave him all the post addressed to the occupier. <laughs> After about the first six weeks, I could tell it started grating on him because I came home from work and he built a big wall down the middle of the living room. It was... <laughs> speaking of wanking in a greenhouse, uh, I'll move on to that one. But speaking of, I don't know if you know this, but May, as well as being the Brighton Fringe, is actually International Masturbation Month. <laughs> this is actually a fucking thing. It actually exists, right? It kind of shows that men rule the world, that, doesn't it, right? Women get a day, breast cancer gets a week, wanking gets a full fucking month, right? June, by the way, is International Wash the Crusty Socks Under Your Fucking Bed Month. And it doesn't surprise me, though, because I know it's, it shows that some men, a lot of men never get out of that frame. You remember when you were like 12, 11, 13, and you started doing it, and it was exciting, right? You started wanking, and you set your alarm clock six hours before you had to go to school, you can get a couple of dozen in, right? No. Some men never get out of that mentality, right? It's, never, it's not uncommon. I bet every bloke in this room has got at least one mate who takes wanking far too fucking seriously. If you're sat there thinking, I haven't got that mate, it's you. Okay, that's... <coughs> I had a mate, when I was at college, when I was 21 at college, I had a mate called Terry, who was the same age as me, and he put so much fucking effort into wanking. He, he was a connoisseur. He, he did physics degree just so he could figure out new ways to fucking wank, okay? <laughs> he was a fucking, he was a legend, right? He, and he used to come up with new ways to do it. And he'd always tell me when he figured something new because he, like, I was like the sample experiment, right? And he come, one, one night he comes running up to me one morning, it's a Monday, and he says, Rich, what hand do you wank with? And I said, well, I'm right-handed, right? And he said, right, next time you're having a wank, don't use your right hand, use your left hand because it feels like a woman's doing it. Hey, hey, you're laughing, but he's absolutely right, because I did it that night, and it was fucking shit. No. <laughs> now, <laughs> let me just add an addendum to that joke, because I've been criticised for telling that joke before. I had a critic write a review of me, and she said I was misogynistic for telling that joke. It was sexist for telling that joke. And, I, and I, you know, you can think what you want, it's fine, it's just a joke, right? But I want to make it clear that to all the women who are in the room here tonight, right? I'm not saying it's all women. It's just every single one I've ever known or heard about, right? It's probably a massive conspiracy. But if you're a woman and you're offended by that joke, right? You want to prove me wrong, I'll be in the toilets after the... Thing, and I'm above all else a sceptic, okay? That's, that's the important thing. It's been a weird month as well, since I've been, I've had to do a few rewrites of the show over the last month, because so much fucking stuff's been happening in the last month, so much news, so there was a couple of weeks where it was just mental, it was solid fucking news, like big stories and that. Biggest story of the last month is without a doubt, uh, Thatcher dying, that was a big fucking deal, right, everyone went on about that, it was, and no one knew how to deal, people were like, oh, so I didn't know how to fucking deal with it. She had only been dead an hour, and Atos had declared her fit for work, I thought that was a little bit... <laughs> little bit insensitive, right, okay? And of course, the biggest irony of Thatcher's death will come in about a million years' time when she's dug up as coal, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, she caused the minor strike, she dies of a minor stroke. These are the fucking... <laughs> these are the balances of life being redressed, right? And, um, and then in the same week as Thatcher dying, it went mental everywhere else as well. It went mental in America because there was that there was that terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon. You remember that one? The big bomb goes off at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Now a lot of comedians 
would see that as a great opportunity to do a bit of material, right? Not me, right? I don't really do, I don't like doing jokes about the Boston Marathon. It's quite a sensitive subject for me because I actually had a mate who was running in it, right? He actually finished fourth and 15th and 27th, right? It was... <laughs> the funniest thing, the, genuine thing, the genuinely funny thing about the Boston Marathon terrorist attack was that, that, that for about four days after the attack, no one knew who fucking did it. And you could, I just like watching both sides of the political spectrum, both extremes, arguing over who the fuck it was. And you could just see all the people on the far left are going, God, I hope it's a domestic terrorist. God, I hope it's a fucking domestic terrorist. And all the people on the far right are going, God, I hope it's a fucking foreigner. God, I hope it's a fucking foreigner, right? Was it a foreign terrorist? Was it a domestic terrorist? Was it a domestic terrorist? Was it a foreign terrorist? It was two guys who were born in Chechnya, but were naturalized American citizens. It's political correctness gone fucking mad, that is the <laughs> Pick a side, lads. We don't know who we're supposed to fucking hate now. It's just, it, it, it's just fucking mental just watching all that, all that shit unfold, right? And um, my, my favourite thing, that's how you could tell. That's how you could tell they're European terrorists. Because European terrorists are the most considerate and thoughtful of all the fucking terrorists in the world, right? Give an example. 9-11. We all know what 9-11 means. If you say 9-11 to someone, no matter where they are in the world, I can say 9-11, you know what I'm talking about, right? But 9-11 didn't happen for us. It was 11-9. <laughs> but America fucked around with the calendar for no bastard in good reason. And, they, and now we all have to call it 9-11. And we do that because we think it's the Americans. They don't know. <laughs> we'll call it 9-11 for them, right? But we knew they wouldn't do it for us. So a few years later, when we had our terrorist attacks in London, when did they happen? 7th of July, 7-7. Even they couldn't fuck that one up for us. <laughs> Considerate, we're thoughtful, right? My favourite news stories of the last couple of months didn't even get any fucking coverage because because of all the other stuff that was going on, it got drowned out. But the, the two, the, these are my two favourite news stories of the last few months, right? And they both come from America. And specifically, they come from the, one of the three parts of America that the, West of the rest of the world recognises. Because we only really see three parts of America. There's California on one end, we like that. There's New York on the other, we like that. And the rest of them are thumbless cousin fuckers who voted for George Bush. That's essentially... <laughs> That's how we define America, really, into those three. Well, the, both of these stories come from the thumbless cousin fucking parts of America. This one comes from Alabama, right? There was a politician who's a Republican called Jim Guile, and he was talking at a town hall meeting, and he obviously didn't realise he was being recorded. And at one point, he used the word nigger, right? Which is not a good idea if you're a politician, right? Now, just to clarify, he wasn't referring to someone in the audience, right? He wasn't just calling some... And he wasn't trying to be gangster or nothing like that, right? Okay. <laughs> He was probably just referring to someone he used to own, I'm assuming, right? But the, <laughs> but the thing was, he used the word thing, and he had to come out and apologise, as you can imagine. Now, even the most cretinous politician in this country, William Hague, right, take for example, if he came out and if he had to fucking apologise, he'd do a good job. You wouldn't believe him, but you'd do a good job, right? This was Jim Dial's public apology for this, right? I should never have used the word nigger. I would like to apologise to all the coloured people I have offended. <laughs> and his PR team are going, why did we let this stupid old duffer write his own fucking speech? Why did we... And then the next story, the same week, the other story, this comes from Texas, again, right, part of America, right? This comes from Texas. This is a 62-year-old uh, primary school teacher called Esther Irene Stokes. She was accused of sexually molesting a seven-year-old black girl in her class. Now, that's not the funny bit, just to make that clear, right? <laughs> that's not the joke, end of the joke there. There is more. I don't want you to think less of me for that, right? But she was accused of sexually molesting a seven-year-old black girl. So she has to go to court to defend herself. This was what her attorney, her lawyer, said to the judge. To be honest, Your Honour, Miss Irene Stokes doesn't even like being in the same room as the black pupils, <laughs> and it makes her cringe when she has to hold their hand. It's not just that she's prejudiced, she's quite possibly the most racist person you've ever met in your entire life. <laughs> this is her defence! Can you imagine anyone else? Your Honour, my client could not have raped all these women, he's a paedophile. <laughs> Poems, I think you'll find that. Speaking of touching kids, what's been going on the last few months of all these celebrities from the 1970s? What the fuck's been... Every week there's a fucking new one, another childhood hero, fucking destroyed. 
It's fucking really started with Jimmy Savile, then it was Stuart Hall, it was Dave Lee Travis, Rolf Harris for fuck's sake! <laughs> Rolf Harris got fucking icky. I was a member of Rolf's cartoon club, I'd have a shower after that news broke. I felt, I felt fucking groomed, it was disgusting, right? <laughs> It was funny when Jim Davidson got accused, because you hate him already. You couldn't think less of him if you fucking tried. Fucking, you know, sexist, racist, ginger, fucking had pink kitty fiddler onto that. Who gives a fuck? It's Jim Davidson, but not Rolf Harris. And then fucking ITV clearly got jealous. They got in on the game. Fucking Coronation Street get any more of their cast arrested. They're going to have their Christmas special in Cambodia. It's fucking it's insane. Tonight, Ken Barlow mysteriously goes on holiday in Coronation Street to join Kevin Webster, who also mysteriously went on holiday. They're running out of fucking real people to arrest from that time period. I'm half expecting to see a news report where they go, Superintendent Spotty have been taken in for questioning, <laughs> along with Baron Von Greenback and Inspector Gadget. Uh, it's a... <laughs> that, actually bit, that bit there, that comes from a real conversation I had with my mum. I was talking to my mum about the BBC sex scandal, like you fucking would, right? Like, we all have that conversation with our mums, right? I'm talking, and I said to her, as a joke, right? I said to her, I can hear you, this isn't TV by the way, right? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this is a birthmark, it's not read for interactive. I know you probably don't get out much, right? Okay. <laughs> I said to my mum, I said, I'm half expecting, there's been so, so many people arrested, they've run out of real celebrities to arrest. I'm half expecting to see a news report where they announce that Morph has been arrested on child sex offences. And my mum with a straight face goes, nah, he was only made of plasticine. <laughs> Yeah, that's the fucking failing in that argument there, isn't it, Mum? He didn't even have a knob. He didn't have a fucking knob either, right? He could have made one, though, couldn't he, right? He could have made one. That's, that's what you do if you're a morph and you're sitting around all day in between recordings. You just make yourself a giant cock and then molest something, destroy the evidence. I don't know. I don't want to judge the guy, right? And he was the only other ethnic minority on TV in the 1980s other than Lenny Henry, so... I've lost the half of the audience here going, who the fuck's morph? I've never fucking heard of him, right? Look it up on the old Wikipedia, it'll be there, right? Now, the thing, these people say that these days. They say that, old oh, racism, you get accused of racism and everything, you can't fucking say anything anymore. And it does, but it does tend to bleed into everything that happens. Now, a few months ago, there was a case involving the pop singer, Beyonce. Uh, she was uh, on the front cover of some shitty, glossy magazine. And she, uh, she accused the people who made the magazine of making her look whiter than she actually was, right? <laughs> Because this is obviously what's been holding her career back, right? She hasn't, she's obviously not popular enough. We need to make her look whiter. Now, I don't know whether this was true, but I thought, let's see if there's any other incidents of this. So I look back, and a few years ago, there was an incident involving the singer Nelly Furtado. She accused uh, GQ magazine of making her look whiter than she actually was. And a few years before that, Mariah Carey accused the magazine of making her look whiter than she actually was. I thought, okay, what's the earliest incident? What's the first incident I can find ever of someone who wasn't white being made to look a lot whiter than they actually were. And I found it, and it was this guy. It was the first case. <laughs> this was the first, uh, this, is, um, this is Jesus, by the way. Young people, you wouldn't have heard of him. No one talks about him anymore, right? This is, and I haven't been cherry picking it. I haven't got, there's another one there. There's another picture there, you can see. Right, same fucking thing. Now Jesus, right, apart from not existing, would not have looked like that, okay? <laughs> But if he did exist, he wouldn't have looked like that, right? He'd have come from the Middle East. He wouldn't have looked like that. He would have, well, you know, if we're being honest, it's more likely he would have looked like that guy, right? That's, that's the more, that's more likely. Now, what, what's going on, mate? <laughs> How dare you accuse someone from an Arab part of the world looking like a fucking Arab? This is, this is Frankie Boyle wouldn't do this, would he? Now, this is it. <laughs> Call it your queer fetus for Jesus, folks. You were warned. Now the thing is, now the thing is that this is what now Jesus would have looked more. If Jesus had walked around in a part of the world where most people look like that, looking like fucking that, he would have been a freak, right? He would have been the biblical equivalent of that guy, right? <laughs> Which unfortunately adds a whole new spin to that fucking thing. Hey, hey, hey. Now. Cherish this, because thanks to the BBC sex scandal, this will be the last Michael Jackson pedo joke you'll probably ever fucking see, okay? So fucking savour it, right? But there does seem to be, there does seem to have also been like a sort of rise of nutterishness, of nutterism, in the last few years in this country. There seems to be, particularly in the world of politics, there's a lot of leaning to the far right, a lot more groups 
and organisations popping up that tend to lean towards the nuttery of the world, right? Um, there's some of the old classics group, some of the old school groups are still along. Uh, for example, uh, the BMP, they're still fucking going. Uh, British National Party, I'm a big fan of theirs. Nick Griffin uh, is actually on Twitter. He actually blocked me on Twitter last year, right? You should follow Nick Griffin if you're on Twitter. Uh, it's like Mind Camp in 140 characters each tweet. It's, <laughs> it's quite fucking special. And the reason Nick Griffin blocked me, the reason Nick Griffin blocked me, he sent out a tweet during the Olympics. And what he said was, he said, have you noticed that during the Olympics, right, all the swimmers are white and all the runners are black, but of course we're all the same, aren't we? Because there's so many swimming pools in sub-Saharan Africa, aren't there, for them to practice, Nick, you fucking cretin, right? So I replied to him saying, at Nick Griffin, MEP, you truly deserve the worst kind of arse cancer an angry god could give you. And... <laughs> And it's not question time level debate material, I'll grant you that, but it's, it's fucking there, okay? But, so, so, but the thing about the BNP that's interesting is, um, I, obviously I've, never, I've just never understood nationalism in, 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 in any sort of way. Nationalism, it always seems to me, it's being proud of falling out of your mum. That's really what it is, right? You, you fall out of your mum, wherever you are, that's the high point of your life. It's all dead, that's what your proudest moment was, right? You fell out of your mum, right? Do you want a biscuit for that, right? Okay, I don't fucking... <laughs> and the arguments they throw around, the arguments they all throw around, they never make any sense to me. Even the, there's the old cliche ones. I mean, we've all heard the cliche, this is a cliche, this argument, but you've all heard it from these people. They go, fucking immigrants, coming over here, stealing our jobs. Now that's never happened. Nobody's ever had their job stolen by an immigrant, right? There's never been one recorded incident of a guy going to work one morning <laughs> like he has done every day for the last fucking ten years he goes to clock in his fucking clocking in card's not there that's weird <laughs> he, he tries his locker his locker key don't fit his photo has been taken down off the staff room wall and replaced with some strange brown fellow he's not having this right? goes to see his boss asks him what the fuck's up and his boss goes sorry Gary but under the government's new Finders, Keepers, Losers, Weepers, Immigration, <laughs> Employment Act, Ranjit came in five minutes before your shift and legally stole your job, right? <laughs> you could take him to a tribunal, but he's got phainites and he's touching the bin, which is home. You can't <laughs> oh, right. It's childish, right? But then, then sometimes they just throw random shit at you when you're arguing with these people. I was having an online argument with one of these fuckers in a chat room, right? And... Uh, because you always end up arguing about fucking racism in some way if you go on an internet chat room, right? Could, the fucking discussion, Coke or Pepsi, what's better? And then someone will just come up, oh, fucking Jews, right? And then they'll just... <laughs> <laughs> they'll come up with something, right? Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to this guy, right? And he says to me, we have to admit, Richard, these immigrants are the reason for the poor education, the homelessness, the unemployment, the disease, and the flooding. Not the... <laughs> like, hold on, what? The flooding, right? I missed that fucking memo. When did we start blaming the immigrants for the fucking flooding? That's a new... Well, is this the BNP's new fucking advertising line? Like, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many immigrants in Britain, it's starting to fucking sink. Now it's... <laughs> the BNP did really badly in the last local election, right? Their, their numbers dropped by 21%. Right? They actually went from... They went from, uh, they went from nine, uh, 30% down to 9%, right? And uh, it's quite funny. The next day, they got a bit fucking desperate. The next day, and they posted an article on their website called A Plan for a New BMP Voter Base, where they encourage their current members to breed more. <laughs> this is their plan to get election, result, for, for election votes in an election where you have to be 18 to fucking vote, right? And the funny thing was they actually said it's time for every loyal BMP member to do their bit, which is a weird nickname for the missus, right? But the... Um, <laughs> And the weird, weird thing was, this was on the, this, this article, this was on the same page as another article saying, piss off, Britain's full. Well, you're just adding to the problem now, aren't you, you fucking nutter? <laughs> Nutters, a lot of them. Another group that popped up a few years ago, who were actually in Brighton not that long ago, uh, the English Defence League, right, they're on the EDL. Uh, they've all got sort of three-letter acronyms, because their fan base are not the most literate, right, so it's BFP, EDL, BFP, NFA, they just go through them all. Right? They've got, and the EDL, if you're not familiar with the EDL, what they basically do is a combination of football hooliganism and rambling, right, that's... <laughs> they've taken these two disparate activities and just put them together, they're a rambling football hooliganist organisation, right, they just show up at a place, 
march down it, smash it up, because if they don't, the Muslims will do it for us, right? And so, and then they fuck off home. That's basically it, right? And uh, they got a bit confused a few months ago, however, when they, they went for a march in Denmark. I'll say that again. The English Defence League went for a march in Denmark, the purposes of which, according to EDO leader Tommy Robinson, was to tell the people of Denmark to stop letting people into their country and tell them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this exactly? This is just, well, well, fuck off then, mate. That's a, that's a sort of basic response they should have had, right? Uh, I got blocked by Tommy Robinson on Twitter too. He's on there as well. Um, you should follow him as well. It's like Mind Camp in 140 characters, but it's much more badly spelt, right? That's because he didn't go to Cambridge, right? And uh, he actually he said he blocked me on Twitter as well last year. FHM magazine did an eight-page spread on the EDL. And he comes and he sends out a tweet saying, tomorrow there'll be an eight-page spread on the EDL in FHM magazine. And I replied saying, normally that magazine's just filled with tits, but it's nice to see there's going to be eight pages of cuts in it as well now. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and he just put, Tommy Robinson on Twitter, he just puts his foot in it. Whoever fucking took, convinced him to get one. He was, try, he was trying to be clever the other day by claiming that he was, you know, he, he was actually sent by the Islamic god Allah to correct the mistakes of the Prophet Muhammad. Unfortunately, he spelt Allah, Alan, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he says, I'm the Prophet, the Prophet Alan has sent me. Which one? Titch Marge? What, which one? <laughs> Who the fuck is that? It's ridiculous. The right? thing about the English Defence League is they like to claim they're a little bit more groovy and, uh, and liberal and open-minded than your average bunch of uh, white nationalists, right? They're, and what they do is they've got all these different divisions. They've got a gay division, his name's Terry, no one's ever seen him, right? <laughs> and they've got a Jewish division, which they had to disband after they found out the leader of the Jewish division had links to terrorist organisations in America. Now, when the Nazis have to kick the Jews out of their group because they're too extreme, <laughs> you know things are going a little bit fucking mad, right? But they got, they set up, they're trying to boost up their membership. They've got the quadriplegic midget division, the French cabaret chanteuse division, the gay animal porn fluffer division. They've got all these different divisions. But they got a bit desperate a little while ago. They got a bit desperate a few months back to try and boost their membership. I'm going to show you an actual screenshot from their website. They set up the English Defence League dog division, right? This is a division of the English Defence League for dogs, right? I'm not making this up. This is the information they put here, right, okay? Police are coming again. Right, here we go. Now, Tyson, that's the name of the dog, right? Tyson of the DDL, Dodd Defence League, right? <laughs> they haven't even spelt fucking dog correctly. <laughs> but what's the Dodd Defence League? Is that the fucking guy with bad hair and big teeth and a feather duster tickling Muslims so they fuck off home? <laughs> or has he been arrested for being a pedo now? I don't fucking know. I can't keep track of them all, right? Not getting dog, no. <laughs> Tyson of the DDL, Dodd Defence League, joined forces with the EDL in protest at the new Islamic Centre in Dagenham. Tyson is the founder member of the DDL, which campaigns against Muslim cab drivers that refuse guide dogs into their cabs on religious grounds, <laughs> and also to stop Canaanism. That's racism against dogs. <laughs> Because the Cat Liberation Front did very well in the recent elections. I don't know if you know about this. Their leader is a tabby with a wonky eye going to send the bastards back, right? I've actually got a picture of Tyson. Do you want to see what Tyson looked like? There he was. a great big fucking Rottweiler. It's a great big Rottweiler. Who saw that one coming? You never had a fucking clue. You're thinking, what kind of dog would the English Defence League possibly buy? It would be a Shih Tzu or a Labradoodle. No, it's a great big fucking Rottweiler, right? And I... I was pissed off. I was pissed off when I saw this picture of Tyson because it meant I could no longer accuse the EDL of not having any black members, right? So, <laughs> and uh, this kind of idea, this kind of mentality, it's kind of all over. Uh, it's kind of all going all over Europe as well. Uh, one of the biggest countries where this sort of stuff is taking off is in Holland, right? And uh, one of the big, the most successful politician who's done well out of this is this guy here. Now, um, his, I don't know if you recognise him. His name is Gert Wilders. Gert Wilders, he is, uh, I, I saw him, I thought, he's changed since the first Willy Wonka film, right? But, <laughs> that's the biggest laugh that joke's ever got, it's crap, I, I keep it in because I like it. Right? Gert Wilders, right, he's the leader of the Dutch Freedom Party. Now, there's a big clue for you right there. 
any political party that's got the word freedom in it is filled with Nazis. This is how it works. It's basically a political coma, but is what I call it. Right? Now, the thing about him, he basically works on the same principles as the BNP. It's all anti-immigration, send them back, don't they close the borders and all that stuff. Right? But the thing about him is, and this might surprise you, he's full of shit. No, 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 no I'm serious. He's full of shit. No, fuck it, wait, wait, right, right. I know, I know he looks like a Gestapo officer in this picture, right? Do you, do you know where he's from, right? He's from Indonesia. He's a fucking Indonesian. He comes over to Holland, right? And he's fucking, he's telling them that they can't fucking start letting foreigners in, right? And I know, look at his hair, right? Look at his, you can see. I know, he, like I said, he, he bleaches his fucking hair. You can see his roots coming through at the top. He, took, but he does this to westernise himself, right? This is what he says, right? It's a good job too, because you can't be taken seriously on anti-immigration policy if you fucking look like that. Do you? <laughs> Right, because that's just one step away from fucking that, right? And before you know it, you're right fucking there, right? <laughs> Obviously, this isn't entirely accurate. They would use a pit of bread. It's a bit crude, that one, but... <laughs> or a wrap, I don't know, maybe a nine. I'm just, you know, I'm just spitballing here. But the thing is, the closest we ever got in this country to having a Gert Wilders-type figure was in 2004 and 2005, when the leader of the UK Independence Party was Robert Kilroy Silk, which I still can't get over. Kilroy was the leader of a political party. <laughs> Fucking Kilroy, right? And he was accused of being racist, right? Leatherbound face, you all know him, leatherbound face. Hair as white as he wished everyone in the country was, right? He was accused, <laughs> he was accused of being racist, mainly because he was the leader of the UK Independence Party, and it's on their application form, right? Now, <laughs> He was accused, right? And you, you know when you know when a racist person tries to prove they're not racist by finding a tenuous link between them and another non-white person, right? He did the best one ever. Like he was asked by some journalists, Mr. Kilroy what do you make of these accusations and allegations that you are in fact racist? And he goes, I can't be racist. I've got a black chauffeur. <laughs> not even friend, right? <laughs> Not even friend, black chauffeur. That's the level he's willing to put his fictional association with black. He might as well have said, I can't be racist. Look, I've got a pet nigger. Come here, son. Come here, Tyson. Come here, boy. There we go. Stroke his hair. It's like wool. It's like fucking wool. Back in your cage, mate. Back in your cage. There you go. He's happy. He's happy. Right? Leave him alone, right? The UK Independence Party, they've been gaining a bit of news recently. Right? And they just keep it. They haven't changed since then. There was a UKIP member, a woman, being interviewed on BBC Radio 4, and the guy asked her, are you racist? She goes, I am, but only from a certain point of view. <laughs> Would that be a non-racist point of view, man? <laughs> well, and then, but then two weeks ago, you might remember the big scandal with UKIP, front page of the Daily Mirror, UKIP member, guy who's a member of UKIP doing that, right? Front page of the Daily Mirror, not a good look for a politician, right? So this guy's doing it, he's on the front page, and of course they've got to fucking come out and justify it. Now Nigel Farage, who's the leader of UKIP, proper spiv, he comes out, right? He comes out, and I think he must have been recovering from a night of heavy crack smoking, or something. Because he comes out and he goes, he wasn't doing a Nazi salute, he was round at my mate's house, having some drinks, and one of them took a picture of him doing an impression of a plant. <laughs> Because when you have your mates round, you know, you get a few drinks, before you know it, the plant impressions are just everywhere. <laughs> Dave, Dave, do your banzai. Oh, it's great, this what? <laughs> what plant was this? The fucking hit the fly trap? I mean, was it just fucking swats the flies out of the fucking air? And then obviously someone like twatted Nigel Farage around the head or he's sobered up or something. He comes out a few hours later and changes his story. And he says, he wasn't doing a Nazi salute, and he wasn't doing an impression of a plant, I was wrong. He was actually reaching for his mobile phone. <laughs> because when you put your mobile phone down, you always put it about two feet out of reach, just above <laughs> your, your head like that, don't you, right? It, it doesn't, this guy did it all the time, right? And he was going, Dave, have you put your fucking phone in the chandelier again, right? Going, yes, I have, Barry, I can't fucking believe it. Fucking, oh, God, let me get a picture of this, okay. <laughs> and the... The, th the thing is, I, I want to make it clear, a lot of people think that because I do... Now, all these groups I've talked about, they all sort of target... They tend to target Muslims and Islam is what they target. And because I do lots of stuff and material about it, people think I'm being soft on the old Muslims and the Islam and all that. And I'm not, right? They've got their nutters too, right? I'm going to talk about them in a second, right? I just think that anything that involves a Muslim gets blown a little bit way out of proportion. And everyone... There's not a sort of proportional response to it. For example, a week and a half ago, 
week and a half ago, Justin Bieber is doing a concert. And halfway through the concert, he stops, right? He stops the concert because it's the Islamic evening call to prayer. And he wanted the Muslim members of his uh, audience to be able to pray, right? And the fucking the letters are written to the Daily Mail at fucking speed about this. The tweets on Twitter are going fucking mad. It's political correct. It's gone fucking mad. Justin Bieber coming to do a fucking concert about telling you to appease these fucking Islamic terrorists. It's famous and stupid and fucking bastard. I've had enough of it. Fucking left wing liberalism going around. And I'm thinking, anything surely that is responsible for stopping a Justin Bieber concert <laughs> should be encouraged, they embrace. Can we have a 24 hour Islamic call to prayer? If it what stops that whiny little bastard fucking carrying on anymore. Maybe it's me, I'm 33, I'm not its target crowd, right? But even the things that are serious problems, that should be taken seriously, they get blown out of proportion as well. Right? If you, if you read the Daily Mail, and you really shouldn't, right? But if you do, right? You'll know they can't go one week without writing a fucking article about the Muslim rape gang epidemic that is sweeping through this nation. Every street corner there is a Muslim rape gang. Every, every alleyway, look out for the Muslim rape gang. They're in your fridge behind the cheese in the morning. You put your shoes on, there's a Muslim rape gang there. Because, of course, if you're being gang raped, the first thought that goes through your head is, I hope this is in keeping with their theological beliefs, right? Because <laughs> I don't want to be gang raped by hypocrites. That's a step too fucking far, right? You'd be there going, can you quote the exact passage in the Quran, lads? Because I'm not, I'm not sure you're allowed to do this, right, okay? Saying that, I'm a, I'm a bit of a lefty. I'd be there wanking them off so I didn't cause a fuss, right? Okay, just, just enjoy yourself, lads. It's multiculturalism. It's great. So... It's diversity, you know what I mean? You don't want to offend anyone, right? Do you want to come in the face now? Or, right, okay, we can wait, right? And then the, the, the incidents that involve really bad, like lots of bad mental Muslims, generally don't happen in this country. Do you remember in 2008, there was a story where a guy from Denmark, a Danish guy, he drew a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb as a turban. Remember that? And within half an hour, most of the Middle East is on fire, right? Okay. And I was watching this, right, and it's quite funny, all these Islamic leaders came out and said, we are no longer going to do any trading with Denmark. I'm like, they only sell bacon, mate. I don't think that's a massive commodity yet. Either that is, unless Peter Schmeichel's converted, I don't fucking know what you're going to be interested in, right? So they come out, and I'm watching this, the next day on the news, they showed you all these clips from this protest in Iran. All these angry Muslims, tens of thousands of them, all marching down the street, burning Danish flags. And I'm sat there for the whole time, and I'm sat there, all I could think of was, where the fuck did they get all those Danish flags from? <laughs> In Iran, right? At a day's notice, right? The only thing I can imagine was there must have been some dodgy fly pitcher in the south of London, right, who saw a window of opportunity here. He's, he's turned the news on, he goes, Dave, the ragheads are round at the Danish, get your fake bin in your turban, we're going to fucking Iran now. Getting a job lot of Danish flags out of the fucking attic, right? You, you'd have seen them there going, like, step right up and show your disgust at the Western infidel, ladies and gentlemen, by burning a Danish flag. Two pound each for an extra quid, I'll soak it in paraffin for you myself, right? I mean, I just hate all of them. I hate all the, I hate these Islamic extremists, and I hate these far-right nationalists. Right? It's like watching AIDS and cancer have a fight with it. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a, you don't care who fucking, we just hope it goes the distance, right? It's fucking really, you know, I think the best way, I'm trying to think, what's the best way to deal with this and what we need to do, right? Find out when the next BMP annual general conference is, right? Where the, we find out the venue, right? Then what we do, we get every Islamic extremist who wants to be a suicide bomber on a coach and we send them to the fucking venue, right? And then they can charge in the venue, all surround them all, pull the cords, bam, right? Now the Muslims, they die vindicated because they took the lives of the evil kuffar dogs from the West. The BMP die vindicated because they fucking, last thing they saw was the hordes of angry Muslims invading in this country, just like they've been telling everyone, and the rest of us in the civilised world are spared dealing with these two groups of annoying cunts, right? <laughs> Thank you for that smattering of applause over there. <clears throat> and if you go to America, it's not just in Europe and Britain, you go to America, nutters over there in fucking Spain. My favourite nutter in America is a guy called Alex Jones who's a big, fat fucking conspiracy theorist from Texas. Again, Texas, right? that, that part of America, right? Big conspiracy theorist, right? He's, he's, he's got a lot of uh, 
press and publicity lately in America because uh, of the gun control thing. Because there's this argument about gun control in America, which from what I can establish, seems to be two groups of people. One group saying, maybe we should just, before we sell a, like, an assault rifle to someone, we should make sure they're not completely fucking mental, right? And the other side going, no! Right? <laughs> in America. They're just so fucking... I've figured out the best way to deal with gun control in America. Right? If you believe that the government is going to come and break into your house and take your guns away from you, the government should immediately break into your house and take your fucking guns away from you. Because <laughs> you're too paranoid for your own good. Right? But Alex Jones, he's got some great conspiracy theories. My favourite conspiracy theories of his involves gay people. He thinks, he's a, I'll, I'll read the whole fucking thing, right? I'll read the exact quote he, he, he gets out here. Right, because he thinks there's more gay people now than there used to be. And he's got a theory as to why. I didn't know this was a problem, right? But he said, the reason there are so many more gay people now is because it's a chemical warfare operation. <laughs> I have the government documents where they say they're going to encourage homosexuality by putting chemicals in our food that turn us gay so that people don't have children. Right? Now that's a perfectly reasonable fucking argument there. Now, of course he doesn't realise there aren't more gay people now than there used to be. There are just more honest gay people now than there used to be. Because about 60 years ago, even in this country, if you were gay, it was against the law, and you went to fucking prison. Right? So people tended to keep still about it. And then, one day, someone in the government had the bright idea. They went, you know what? I don't think prison is the best place to put men to dissuade them away from bum sex. <laughs> and I went, you're damn right, Steve, said Clement Attlee, right? And my favourite, uh, my favourite, one of my favourite political nutters in America, and he's the last nutter I'm going to talk about tonight before I move on, right, is uh, you probably won't recognise this guy, but you'll definitely know of the organisation he used to work for. It's this guy here. Now, uh, his name is, uh, his name is David Duke. He's the former leader of the Ku Klux Klan, right? right? So you might have heard of them, they're the angry men with the rope and the burning crosses, right? And uh, if you don't know about him, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is a, um, everyone's, I love the fact everyone, don't look at them, it's okay. They're just coming in making a noise, it's okay. Uh, if you don't know about this guy, he is a Holocaust denier and an anti-Semite, uh, but he's got his bad points as well. I don't want to big him up too much, right? Okay. <laughs> Some of these are still jokes, by the way, it's fine. Now, again, the, now, the thing about David Duke is I respect David Duke. And the reason I respect David Duke, I respect any politician, regardless of his beliefs, who is willing to sort of go above and beyond the call of duty to prove to you that he believes in what he's saying. And David Duke has done that, and I'll show you why. Because one thing David Duke believes in is racial segregation. <laughs> and he's taken it to such an extreme <laughs> that he's separated the white and the brown hairs on his own fucking head. <laughs> You can't help but respect that man, I can't anyway. Now, all these people I've talked about, since I've got on stage tonight, all I've talked about are nutters, right? All I've talked about is all these different types of nutters, right? And the thing is, right, I saw, when it comes to these nutters, I'm always sat there, you know, they were, they were probably quite, most of them were probably normal people at one point in their life, right? And then they just snapped one day. Because I bet you've all, I bet everyone in, the, in this room can think of one personal, one personal example from their own life of one person you knew, who was a perfectly reasonable, decent human being, and then one day they woke up and went, oh, fuck this. I'm going to be a nutter for the rest of my fucking life, right? It's going to be a massive shit. I don't fucking care anymore, right? Fuck it, right? And I thought, and I start thinking, well, I wonder if that's going to happen to me. Am I just going to fucking wake up one day, or I'm just going to walk, am I just one day for no reason just going to snap and go, and I'm going to suddenly be one of these fuckers, right? And then I remembered, as I was thinking that, I realised, I almost fucking did, right? And I'm gonna end the show tonight, I'm gonna to tell you the true story of how I nearly became a nutter. <laughs> I hate the fact that people always laugh at that bit, right? I, <laughs> fuck you. Now, the, um, now, I've got to tell you, this is a true story I'm gonna tell you. I'm not proud of it, it gets a bit grim in places, but it's a true story, okay? So let's move, let's, let's go on. Now, let me give you some geography of the story, right? Uh, it's 2005. I'm living in Winchester, which is just down the road from here. Right? Uh, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> just cheer as you come in. Thank you very much. Right? I'm living in Winchester, right? And uh, I'm going out of a girl. Yeah, no, a girl. Seriously, right? 
fucking serious, right? There was a girl, right? Some of you just lost a five a bit with your mate there, haven't you? Right? Yeah. <laughs> he fucking wasn't. No, he gave you what's right. I'm, I'm, I'm in Winchester and I'm going out with this girl who lives in South East Gate in Faversham. So we're about five, uh, so we're about, we're about uh, 120 miles apart, right? We're about 120 miles apart. Right, now, we were going out a few days. We used to see each other week by week. We'd alternate when she see she'd come for two days. Uh, well, she'd visit for two days. She wouldn't come. That would be... Not, I'm not an animal, right? Okay, so she'd visit. She'd visit for two days, and then I'd visit her for two days, and then vice versa, vice versa, right now, okay? And it's going well. The relationship's going well, right? It's, uh, you know, solid. No great big plans for the future, but it's a solid relationship. And then one day, I'm in Winchester. It's 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday. She's in Faversham. <coughs> she rings me up on the phone, and she gives me some news, some very bad news. She says, Richard, I'm pregnant. Now, I didn't need to hear that. I did, don't fucking clap that. Right? <laughs> Listen, mate, this show's called Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus. You might be able to work out how this story ends, right? You won't be clapping by the end, right? So, okay, now. now, this is the thing, right? I don't want to fucking look after each other. I'm fucking, I'm scared shitless now. Big chills, goddamn this bow, back bowels have loosened up. I'm fucked, right? Because it took me, once it took me half an hour to find the cue on my keypad on my laptop. I don't fucking need a human being to fucking look after on top of that. Have you ever done that? You're like, it was here yesterday. There was a fucking queue here. Right, let's go start. <laughs> JS1 thing. Now, you just go with it, right? So I don't need another human being. But fortunately, before I had to express my fucking concern, my girlfriend said, I don't want to have this kid. And I was like, yes! Right? I, well, I didn't do that out loud, right? I mean, <laughs> kept that very much inside my own self, right? I've played it down, though, right? But I, she's got to, we're going to say, right, okay, we're going to terminate the pregnancy. But here's the problem. We have to wait four weeks, right? Now, for that four-week period, I don't want to make out that what I was going through was anything as bad as what she was going through, obviously. But what I was going through was every day for that four-week period, all I could think was, please don't fucking change your mind. <laughs> please do not fucking change your mind. Don't phone me up one day with that fucking phone call. I don't want to fucking hear this, right? I'm scared shitting myself every time the phone rings. Don't change your fucking mind, right? Now, the thing was, when it comes to abortion, I've always been pro-choice. That's always been my position. I'm sure many people here have that position or whatever. Uh, but my position's always been pro-choice. And I always thought I knew what that meant. It meant abortion It's the woman's right to choose. Her body, her choice. That was until my girlfriend got pregnant. <laughs> and then suddenly the choice, pro-choice suddenly became, right, here are your choices, darling. The doctor does it, or I'm going to fucking do it, okay? This is what... <laughs> This is how it fucking works, okay? You go to the medical centre where it's safe and the professionals can do it, or there's going to be a strategically placed roller skate at the top of the stairs at three in the fucking morning. I'm setting off the fire alarm, there's a bath full of gin and coat hangers downstairs. What do you fucking want, okay? I didn't put it quite like that. I should have coated it somewhat, right? Okay, but... Got to be firm, right? Now, the, fortunately, fortunately, there was one. Unfortunately, there was one incident where we did have to deal with a bunch of anti-abortion pro-life wankers. Right? We had to go to the clinic. We had to go to the clinic once a week, and on the second week we went. As we're leaving, there's a bunch of these fucking gormless-looking fuckers with their stupid fucking folk festival jumpers and glasses on, right? Old chanting. And then the people who shout at women who leave these clinics and go murder, murder, being led by this dog-collared fucktard. Right, who was there, right? And, I'm, and he starts har they start harassing my girlfriend. I'm not going to stand for that. So I stood up to the bugger and started like, getting in his face about it, right? And we're going back and forth, and I realised this is futile. And then I find out this guy's a Catholic priest, right? So I said to him, right, as a Catholic priest, the only reason you are against abortion is because when you see a picture of an aborted fetus, you think, oh, I could have been molesting that in seven years' time. <laughs> Throw that one in at Christmas dinner, surprise your name. Now, nigga. <laughs> I want to make this clear now. Because people think, because I've written a comedy show, uh, I've written a comedy routine about this, that this was funny to me. It wasn't. It was not funny in the sight. We were on the most traumatic, stressful, upsetting, emotionally draining four weeks of my fucking life. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone as a Devon and Red Letter Day special, okay? It's not. It wasn't fun, right? And the problem with it, though, the problem with this is the reason it's not, because it, you're going through it, you don't feel you can talk to anyone about it. You don't feel you can actually get this off your chest with anyone. You don't feel you can express, because there's, no matter how cool and groovy we are about abortion, the fact of the matter is, there's this black cloud that hangs over abortion. Whenever you bring it into a conversation, whenever you mention it, and there's this tension that fucking just rises, and you don't feel you can get, you don't feel like you deserve sympathy from anyone, right? And because of that, <coughs> you don't, you don't know how to talk to anyone. And because of that, nobody fucking knows how to talk to you, right? 
Not even the professionals at the medical centre knew how to deal with it. And the week before, the week before she's due to have the abortion, on a Friday, we went into the centre and she has to have an ultrasound, one of the scans, right? I don't know why, they had to make sure the baby was healthy before we killed it, right, okay? Because my taxes are going into this, what my fucking money's worth, right? I don't want to spaz, right, okay? I don't want to just be killing some cripple, it'll be a waste of time, right, okay? What the full fucking Christmas dinner. Now, so here we go. So she's doing the scan, the nurse, right, she's doing the scan, right, does the scan, everything's fine. Then she prints off a copy of the scan, leans over to me and goes, would you like to keep that, sir? What? Would you like to keep the copy of this? No! Of course I don't want to keep it, you stupid fucking cow. Why would I want... I don't want to keep the thing that it's a copy of. Why do I want... This is not a fucking Kodak moment for us here, darling. This ain't like the fucking generation game where you get a cuddly toy and you don't get a fucking big prize at the bloody end, right? What am I going to do with this exactly? What did you think was my plan? I'm going to go, oh yes, we'll put this in the photo album. We'll, we'll reminisce about this in years to come. Oh, darling, do you remember when we killed our unborn child? That old Corky, what would he have grown up to be, right? Well, am I supposed to torture my parents with this one? Give it to my mum. So there you are, mum. There's the grandchild you're never going to fucking get, okay? Because I'm an irresponsible cunt, right? Don't buy him any clothes. He won't grow into them, right? <laughs> If you went for a mastectomy, they wouldn't give you a tit in a presentation case to take home with you, would they? Here's your bollocks on a plinth. Well done for surviving cancer, sir. Right? They wouldn't do that. If you're going to be this insensitive about it, why don't you go to the full hog, put the fetus in a jar and make us wear it around our neck like a sort of perverted version of Flavor Flav from Public Enemy. We can march down the street and people can throw raw tomatoes at us and fucking pelts and shout abuse. Bollocks, put an abortion gift shop at the fucking end of the clinic as you're on your way out. Like the fairground when you go on a roller coaster. Get your scan, put on a t-shirt under the phrase, better luck next time, Junior. <laughs> Now, because of this, I was asked never to return to this abortion clinic ever again. Right? I've never been barred from a pub in my life, right? I get banned from going to an abortion clinic, right? Now, because of this, I was not allowed to go the following week to my girlfriend when she had to, with my girlfriend when she had to go through the procedure. Do you know how much of a wanker that makes you feel? You can't even be there for the aborting of your unborn child, right? It's fucking makes you feel it's pathetic, right? So I, I've, I've fucked up completely now, right? Because I genuinely lost the shit with the nurse, right? So I've now gone, I'm now fucking back in Winchester, right? It's the week she's about to have the abortion, right? And I'm there, it's a Monday, right? She's having it on a Friday, I'm at work on a Monday. And I can't take it anymore, and I have a nervous breakdown at fucking work, okay? I just collapse on the floor in a, bit, in a big puddle of snot, tears and wailing, right? Just collapse on the fucking floor. And my work legally had to send me home on a week's paid leave which I didn't know they had to do, so I've done it three or four more times since then. <laughs> if you take nothing else from this show, and you won't, right, fucking take that with you. There's a little gift to you. You want a week off work, just fucking start crying, right? They're taking onion with you at work, right? So they've sent me home, and now it's even worse. Now it's even worse. Now I'm at home on my own, sat there. Now, the one thing I used to do to try and take my mind off things in my free time, in my spare time, one thing I used to do was I was really into science as a kid, right? And I got into chemistry when I was a teenager, right? And so I, I used to do chemistry all the fucking time. All the time when I was like, spare time, any time I had to holidays or work, I was always mucking around with chemistry. Got to the point where I was actually a professional level uh, chemist, right? Now, my friends used to call me a junkie, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> But that's politically incorrect and offensive, right? So I used to call myself a chemist, right? Now, so I, now this week's a stressful week. I've got to do some serious fucking chemistry to get through this fucking week, okay? So I phone up my mate Wayne. Fucking, that's a name you can trust when you want to get hold of some chemicals, right? So I phone Wayne up. Wayne's there in my house within an hour with 35 grams of uncut methamphetamine. That'll do for me nicely. Right? So the week fucking flies by. I'm shoveling that in. It's great. Right? I fucking, it takes my mind off it. Everything goes right. But now it gets to Friday morning. It's like Friday morning about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And I've run out of drugs. And they're starting to wear off. Right? And I've been awake for 127 hours at this point. Right? And the drugs are starting to wear off. And it's the day of the abortion. And all I wanted to do was I wanted to not have to cry. That was the one thing I wanted to do. I'm not going to do this for anyone. I'm just going to do it for myself. I don't want to fucking cry. One minute past midnight, I can cry my fucking eyes out. Not now, right? 
awake, not today, but I've been awake for 127 hours. If you've ever been awake for a long period of time, you know the littlest thing can fucking set you off. I nearly burst into tears at one point, a pen leaked in my pocket, I thought I had a varicose vein, I thought, fuck, right? <laughs> So I thought, right, I've got to try and get out. I've got to try and stop myself from crying. What can I do? I can feel the emotion bubbling up right there. I don't want to fucking let it get me, get the better of me. So what can I do? So I'm trying to think logically, but my brain's not thinking very logically. Okay? So I'm thinking, right, what can I do to stop me from going, right, okay. I know. I'll go to Tesco's. <laughs> because I've never seen anyone cry in Tesco's. <laughs> So there must be something about Tesco's that stops you fucking crying. Brilliant, right. It's open 24 hours, I'll go there, thanks for that mate. Right. It's open 24 hours, I'll go there and I'll stay there till midnight, right, okay? So, Tesco's is only about half a mile down the fucking road. But the problem with Tesco's is like, it's, I, I've, I've been awake for so long doing the old dressage walk down there fucking, and I can't get out, I can't walk there too quickly. By the time I get to Tesco's, it's 11.30. I knew it was 11.30 because there's a big clock above the entrance of Tesco's, right, in Winchester. It's 11.30. So I walk in to Tesco's, right? I walk in, and I, my watch said 11.30 as I'm walking in. My phone, which I had checked, said 11.30. It's 11.30. Right? I walk into Tesco's. The next thing I fucking remember, I'm halfway down the fruit and veg aisle, staring longingly at an aubergine in my left hand. <laughs> and I look at my clock, and it says quarter past 12. And I don't know how I fucking got here. And I thought, obviously, there's been a rip in the space-time continuum. I have leapt forward into the future. And I thought, no, that's silly. What's more likely to have happened, and in fact, what actually had happened, was as I walked into Tesco's, my sleep-deprived bl brain blacked out, right? And I slept-walked instinctively down the fruit and veg aisle to the aubergines, picked one up, and I've now been standing there staring at it for three quarters of an hour. <laughs> and I knew that was the case because there was a load of like, three or four members of staff from Tesco sort of hanging around behind me going... <laughs> so I thought, I've got to get out of this with some fucking dignity. So I just went... Yep, that's the fucking aubergine for me. That's the one right there. You've got to check these things thoroughly, mate. You've got to fucking... You've got to... Have you seen Panorama? Terrorists, but anthrax in these. You've got to hold them to the light, right? Okay. I've got my fucking aubergine. So I'm going down... I'm, I'm like Neville Chamberlain marching down the fucking drink with the aubergine in my fucking head. I get to the end. I get to the end of the fruit and veg aisle, and I get this almighty, crippling pain in my stomach. It's fucking unbearable. It's not like a twinge. It's like... It, just, it hits me instantly. I'm just like... Ow! Oh! Oh, fuck! Oh! Oh, Jesus fucking Christ! Oh, fuck! Everyone behind me scatters, because they're thinking two dozen aubergines are about to fly out of this bloke's arse, right? He's clearly going for the Guinness World Record with like, aubergines in one rectum, right? So I'm suddenly going, oh, fucking hell, what is this pain? What is this? It's fucking, oh, God, I can't stand this, right? And I, and I remember, hold on, it's quarter past twelve. That's the same time as my girlfriend's appointment to have her abortion. It's the exact moment, at the exact moment when she is 120 miles away, undergoing a medical procedure that is causing her great pain and discomfort in her womb, I am 120 miles away in Winchester, in Tesco's, experiencing a great deal of pain in where my womb would be if I had one, right? So this is freaking me out quite spectacularly at this point. I'm really fucking scared. Now, I'm not a religious man. I'm not a holy man or a spiritual man. You might have fucking figured that out from this uh, right, sh that show. But I'm sat there, I'm, I'm in a crisis of faith here in Tesco's, right? I'm thinking, whatever's doing this, this can't be a coincidence. It cannot be a coincidence. Whatever's doing this, it must be some higher power. Let's call it God, right? And God is punishing me right here, right now. He's sending me a message for me being irresponsible with life, because only he gets to give life and take it away, not me, and he's punishing me for the pain and the misery and the suffering that I have caused. And I'm starting to freak out, and I don't want to be the first guy to cry in Tesco's, so I think I've got to get out of here right fucking now. But I've got to pay for my aubergine first, okay? <laughs> don't fucking lie, I've got to pay for it, haven't I? I've just stood there looking at it for 45 fucking minutes. If I go put it back and walk out, I'll have a right loony, wouldn't I, right? <laughs> So I get to the fucking checkout, there's only one guy in front of me, right? And I'm fucking, forget holding in the tears, it's at the fucking, it's the point of no return. I'm there, and you know when you're just trying to hold it in, I'm just like... <laughs> guy in front of me going, 
goes away. Check out girl. Next, please. Check out girl. 17 years old. Her name was Stacy. Best fucking check out girl I've ever seen in my life, right? Didn't bat an eyelid, didn't flinch. Professional. Thick as pig shit, really. Borderline psychopathic, I'm being like, No ability to read human emotions or understand the reality of the world around her. And I needed that. I needed someone who was not too clued in and figuring out what kind of stress I was under at that point because I wanted to get the fuck out of there really quickly, right? So she goes there, just to the aubergine, sir. She bristles the fucking thing out of me. I had a vice like grip on it. I'm just stood there trembling. Like, she does this, and she just tucks in a 4,000 digit code for aubergine, puts it in a bag, and then she looks at me and goes, Do you have a Tesco Club Points card, sir? <laughs> yes, I do. Because <laughs> I did. Right? And I could have just said no, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to get something out of fucking today. I'm going to be a winner at something, right? So fuck you. I'm going to get some. I'm going to be a, a fucking uh, I'm going to get my 170th of a fucking Tesco club point on my aubergine, right? Fuck you, right? So I've got my wallet out of this. Uh... It's not there. It's not fucking there. And then I remembered, do you know where it was? I was at home, I'd left it, I was doing that to cut up all the fucking drugs, I'd be sticking up my fucking Uber all fucking week. And that was the straw that broke the fucking camel's back for me. This on top of a dead baby, no one can handle that in one fucking day. So I just fucking went nuclear, biblical fucking meltdown. Fucking threw my wallet in the air, bus tickets and change go flying everywhere, and I go, <laughs> to be wearing off 
at the exact same time as my girlfriend's abortion appointment. And that's when the poo started kicking in, right? It was a massive coincidence. And as I've dropped to my knees, it's all come flooding out, right? I'm shaking, I'm trembling. And I don't know what the quickest conversion to deconversion is of any religion. I fucking shattered it that fucking day. Nothing will make you believe that there is no God with a divine plan than when you find yourselves on your knees in Tesco's with your arms in the air and your pants filled with duty. And for some fucking reason, when you crap yourself in public, it always smells ten times fucking worse than it does when you're at fucking home, right? So I'm now stuck there and I'm going, I don't know what I'm going to, I can't get out of this. <laughs> There's no way I can get out of this with any dignity. I'm fucked, right? I'm fucked. What am I going to do? You're an idiot, right? And time had just frozen. I don't know like, how long I was there. I could have been there 10 hours, 30 seconds. But it was broken by Stacy. Bless her. She saw me on the floor. She leant over with a bit of paper in her hand. And she looked at me and said, would you like an application form for a Tesco club card, sir? <laughs> which I took, because they never had any toilet paper in that Tesco's, and I didn't end up travelling the world telling people to get right with Jesus. I just went round the world now telling people the story of how I nearly went mental enough to go around the world telling people to get right with Jesus. If there's any moral you can take from this, it's if you're in a bad way, just take some drugs and don't leave the fucking house, okay? That's all I can offer you. Have you had a good time, folks? Thank you. Um, uh, that is the end of my show. That's my story and the stuff I had to tell you. Uh, like I said, we are all different. We've all got differences. And you know, all the people in that, as I talk about, these are people who recognise differences, but they go about it the wrong way, right? Just you know, don't be a cunt. That's the moral of the story. That's the best philosophical line I could pull out of this. Just don't be a cunt about it, right? Because that's, thank you for that. It's one person approves of that. You know? But what I'm going to say tonight, it's, uh, this has been a free show, and I hope you have enjoyed yourself, and I hope you go away and enjoy the rest of the festival. This has been my last night. It's been a wonderful play here for 12 nights on the trot, and I'm going to get to go home tomorrow, back to reality, uh, and back to Tesco's, right? But the, um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. It has been a free show. I'm going to be holding a, uh, a jar at the end if you want to put some money in there. Let's see. The microphone's heckling me now. Fuck it. Right? We, we don't need the microphone, do we? Because this is old school, right? So... <laughs> Watch me carry on seamlessly like this didn't fucking happen. We're going to edit that out of the video, right? We're going to put more laughter in as well. Right, okay. So. I'm going to be holding a jar at the end. If you want to put something in there, like I said, you could have paid a fiver to go see your average show tonight. If you thought it was worth that, that'd be great. You could put that in. Other than that, uh, it's been a great night, and I hope, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. This has been Eat Your Queer Figures for Jesus. My name's Richard Coughlin. Take care. Good night. May God be less. Take care. <laughs>